we're all in the room um, and, and I would uh, like to thank everybody and particularly you, Peter. And before we begin, I would like to, well, actually, as we begin, I would like to acknowledge the Bundjalung people's traditional custodians of lands on which this gathering is taking place this evening. And I would like to pay tribute and respect to the elders, both past, present and future of the Bundjalung, Gambangir and Yagel nations, which extend across the Clarence Valley Council area. I would also like to pay respect to any First Nations people here this evening and pay respect to the lands and nations from where you might be joining us online this evening. Um, we're going to kick off because we, we, we have been waiting and there's a, a lot of anticipation, I think, in, in the room. Um, we're all here because Peter's uh, book, Bush School, has recently been published and he, we are very lucky to have him share his his book, uh, his writing and his experiences with us this evening. So um, what we're going to be doing, just a bit of housekeeping, if you can keep your um, microphones on mute, um, uh, Peter's going to be speaking to us. I will be prompting with a few questions. If um, those of you who are familiar with Zoom, yes. there's a little chat um, icon either on your iPad or on your computer and feel free to load that up with some questions for, for Peter and we'll go through those at the end or if anybody's not comfortable with that once we've sort of run through a, a bit of conversation maybe after 25 minutes or so um, I'm, I'm happy to respond to vague vague waves down a video or, um, or, or a raised salute whatever you can manage we're all working with them um, with technology. Peter good evening. Good evening, Jane. Good evening to all the people who've linked in. Um, thank you very much for joining us. Now, uh, your book, Bush School, which is available through our library service, but um, is also available for purchase, um, was published when? It was published uh, 4th of August. 4th of August, so it's very recent. Hot off the press. Hot and off the so, press, yeah. So Bush School really... Um, I mean, it, it's a memoir, if you like, of, of your experience in Wibonga, um, Wibonga and Wibonga Primary School, um, but really talks a lot about your, your teaching experience and the experience of, of community in regional New South Wales, which I think um, quite a few of us here will be familiar with the regional New South Wales experience. Um, how long has this book been a burning desire? to write or, or how long have you been, write, been you, have you been writing it? Not very long at all. Um, it was never a burning desire, this book. I had no intention of writing a book about my experiences in 1960 and 1961 in Weabonga. But I went to Teachers College in 1956 and 57, quite some time ago. And in 2017, the people who were in that cohort at the Teachers College had a 60-year reunion. And at the 60-year reunion, it was mentioned that there were 22 of us who had had one teacher school experience and that it would be really good for those 22 people, if they were so inclined, to write down a couple of thousand words about that experience because there aren't many one-teacher schools left in New South Wales. And certainly the experience that we had back in the late 50s and early 60s is no longer possible to have. So it's just a suggestion that we write a couple of thousand words. I thought that was a good idea, Jane, so I did. And then I found that nobody else was writing any, any words at all. But by the time I'd started writing, and thinking that 2,000 words would be all that I would be able to write because my memory would be so shot to hell I wouldn't be able to remember anything from 60 years ago. I actually remembered an awful lot. I remembered practically everything about those two years. I remembered being in the little one room school and I remembered all of the students that I had, what they looked like, what they sounded like, what they were like as little individuals. And I had an enormous amount to write once I started to write and it just kept happening. It forced itself upon me, Jane. It forced itself upon me. <laughs> <laughs> 
Much, I imagine, like the school itself did when you um, went fresh from teacher training college in Sydney, I believe. Yeah, um, in Sydney, Balmain. To Weabonga. Um, how did you feel before you had gone to the school about, about going to a one-teacher school um, somewhere where I, I'm assuming, but that may be incorrect, you had never been to before? I had never been to a one-teacher school, no. I had uh, very rarely been to the New England region. But what I was appointed to was a school called Guy Fawkes, which is between Armadale on the Armadale Grafton Road. And when I got to Guy Fawkes, there were only six people, so I was not able to open the school. Then you had to have an average of 10 students per day to keep a one teacher school open, and there simply weren't enough students. So I had to go back into Armadale to talk with the inspector, and the inspector said to me that he was very pleased that I'd turned up because he had a couple of schools which he needed to open and he didn't have a teacher until I came. So he mentioned these schools to me. The first one that he suggested I might like to take was Ward's Mistake. Now, I know people find it hard to believe that there is a place called Ward's Mistake, but there is. And when I heard Ward's Mistake, I thought, not for me. I'm not about to make the same mistake as Ward make. Ward was uh, Captain Starlight or Captain Moonlight, one of those bushranger persons. Anyhow, I thought, no, Ward's mistake was not the sort of town that I wanted to go to. It's probably a nice place. I've never been there. Um, then he mentioned another, but he ended up with Weabonga, and he told me that Weabonga was one that was um, of great concern to him. It uh, had been closed down. He needed to open it up. The parents were very anxious that he find a teacher for them. It was the most remote of his schools. He found it very hard for any teacher that he appointed there to stay. Um, people just were not staying uh, for a long period of time. And as a consequence of that, the standards of the students at that little school according to the inspector, had fallen behind and he needed someone to accept the appointment, to go there and stay for a couple of years and to take great care and concern with the students to get their standards back up to where they needed to be and get the place running well. When I heard him say that, I thought, well, I know where he wants me to go. He's not selling it to me. He is quite clearly making out that it is a remote and difficult location, but it is a location that desperately needs a teacher. So I said, all right, well, if that's the one that you're most concerned about, that's the one I'll go to. So that's how I ended up in Weabonga, but I was not ready. Mm. And on, a, on arrival, um, you know, you, you, you meet the children, you, you find the, the community. Um, one of the things that I, I was noticing it, you, you mentioned was about that sort of focusing on self-determination for the children. Um, but given the difficulties that you were talking about, that, well, that the inspector had been sp speaking about, how did you come to that conclusion? And, and was it um, something that had come from your teacher training? Or was it something that when you entered that space or you entered that school, you thought, okay, this is probably the way I'm going to have to go? Uh, look, it wasn't something that came from my teacher training at all. Uh, back then in the 50s, uh, education was very regimented, very strict, very um, controlled by the syllabus and, and the uh, curricula and by the timetable. Each of the subject areas had to be given a certain amount of time each week. Uh, the syllabus was very strict. It was very teacher directed. All of the chairs were screwed to the floor so that once the students were in the schoolroom, they could not move out of their chairs, could not move at all. And to get into those schoolrooms, one lined up and marched in, in military fashion. It was all very regimented, Jane, and that was the sort of introduction to teaching that I had at Balmain Teachers College. So no, it didn't come through my training, 
It had come through my first year of experience at a school in Sydney called Kegworth, where I had identified that, that the system in place did not suit me. And I also identified that it didn't suit the kids. And in fact, I found the kids at Kegworth, an inner city school in Leichhardt in Sydney, were very creative. They were very full of ideas. They had lots and lots of things that they would like to learn about. So I found that if I opened it up, opened up decision-making to the children, then they very quickly identified stuff that we could share and we could learn and we could work on together. So by the time I got to Weabonga, I really wanted to be child-centred. I really wanted to be pupil-focused and child-centred. And because I was on my own, with nobody else, nobody to interfere, nobody to tell, tell me what to do, I did what I wanted. And what I wanted to do was to have the children as the focus for everything that we did. And what did they, what did they, want, to, what did they want to learn about? What, what was it that you brought that you think um, excited them or, or opened up that experience for them? Well, they excited me uh, more than I excited them. One of the things that they wanted to learn was all about, all about sheep and cattle and farms and shearing. And there were so many things that they wanted to learn, which lent themselves to every kind of mathematical endeavor, to every kind of writing endeavor, to every kind of scientific inquiry. The children had so many questions, which if we followed up, and we used their questions and their interests as our focus, we covered the curriculum anyway. They wanted to learn to read because they wanted to learn all about the topics that interested them. So they wanted to read about them. So they had a natural interest in learning to read. And over the two years that I was with them, they all progressed very well at reading. And so just using the the questions that naturally arose from the children, we were able to focus on the things that interested them and to do all of the work that was required of us by the curriculum. I was really concerned that when the inspector came to inspect, which he did twice, uh, that neither I nor the children would be found wanting. I wanted the inspector to see that the children had raised their own standards and had done that very well. And I wanted him to see that my approach of focusing on the kids had worked very well as well. So I was concerned about standards just as the inspector was, just as the Department of Education was. But it all came naturally. It all happened because the children wanted it to happen. Do you think that there's anything, we talk about the differences between, you know, schooling at that time in that era and, and schooling now, but what are the types of similarities, I'm particularly thinking about students at the moment who, who are equally isolated, if you like, but sometimes working from home or online or they have been during COVID. Well, just remember this, that we had no, no resources whatsoever. Um, I, in the book, I referred to a monk from the Middle Ages feeling right at home if he'd come into our little one room school. We had no electricity, no power. We had no running water. We had no sewage. We had no resources. We had a room, a blackboard, some chalk, 18 children and me. That's what we had. So we can't even compare it to what's happening in many, many homes across Australia uh, during COVID and across the world. I mean, all the children in the United States are all at home trying to learn as well. But all of those children at home, well, the majority of them have access to the internet. They have access to iPads and computers. We had nothing like that, Jane. We had nothing of that whatsoever. What we had was what we had, just us and some paper and some pencils and a blackboard and some chalk, full stop. So I can't compare it very much to what's happening now. I can compare it to this though. I think the parents are terribly concerned about the children learning at home. Can I say to parents, don't worry so much. Can I say to parents, 
what happens at home and what happens at school are different things. And nobody expects parents to be teachers. Just as when I was a teacher in that little one teacher school, I was not the parent of those students. I was their teacher. I was the professional and I had a particular set of um, things that I had to achieve. Parents do not have to do that. Parents are not teachers. So with the children at home, I would suggest that they do what I did. Find out what the kids want to learn. They will have lots of things that they want to follow up, lots of things that they want to do. Find out what your children want to learn and concentrate on those. Now, the, thank you for that. The parents of the children at Weabonga, was there much interaction between the parents, the families, the school? Not a great deal. Back then, uh, there was a differentiation between home and school, much closer now, fortunately, much better now. The school and the families try to work much closer together now, which is as it should be. But in the late 50s, no, there wasn't a great deal of interaction between home and school. There was a great deal of respect, not a great deal, more respect for teachers back then. And the parents expected the teachers knew what they were doing and they would get on and do it in a professional way. So the teachers uh, were uh, able to do what they needed to do without interference from parents. And the parents would have thought of it as interference back in the 50s and 60s. I don't think they think of it that way now. They think of it as interest or of being concerned or whatever. They think of it in a positive way. But back then, parents did not become very involved in schools. We had a Parents and Citizens Association, which met once a month and four or five of the parents came along and we talked about all kinds of things, very little of them to do with education. Uh, but that was about it. That was about the involvement of the parents in the education of the kids then. Um, and how then did you um, connect in, back into the community? How did you cope in Weabonga outside? Didn't. Not at all. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> when I arrived in Weabonga, I was introduced by the mail car driver who got me there in his mail car to uh, the house where I would be staying, the only house of five. There were five houses in the village of Weabonga. It was a hamlet, not much of a village, certainly not a town. I was introduced to the uh, woman of the house, to my landlady, and uh, the house was uh, an older weatherboard, uh, quite dilapidated, uh, badly maintained, never painted. The timber had never been treated in its entire history. So it presented very badly indeed. The roof was of tin, rusting away, holes in the roof. I was not impressed with where I was about to be asked to live. When I went into the house, I was shown onto the front veranda and the front veranda consisted of a veranda floor and a couple of posts, veranda posts, and across the veranda post had been tacked up some tar paper. That's paper impregnated with tar to make it waterproof. So that was it. That was where I was to stay. I had a bed behind a sheet of tar paper. I had nothing else. Nothing else. And the family with whom I was staying uh, did not invite interaction at all. So I ate all of my meals on my own and I had no interaction with the family. So I was very isolated, Jane. And I met none of the other parents except the parents who turned up the first day. I met them, but I didn't see them again. As we were just saying, there was very little interaction between parents and the school. So I did not see them again for a couple of months, <laughs> a couple of months. So there I was isolated on my own, feeling very, very um, separated, feeling very, alone. I love um, being with the kids. Yes, but that would, that would have been a very difficult period, particularly 
um, over, over two years. That's, um, that's a long time to spend in isolation. Um, I didn't I've, stay in isolation for two years, so Jane. No. I had, uh, yeah, I made up my mind after about uh, eight weeks that uh, the conditions under which I was being asked to list were not tenable for me. I was very rapidly going downhill, both physically and emotionally as well. I was very uh, stressed and I thought this is no good for me. And because it's no good for me, it's certainly no good for the children. The children need to have a happy teacher with them, not somebody who's anxious and worried. So I had made up my mind that I would ask for a transfer. And if I didn't get it, I would resign. I had made up my mind that I would not stay at Weabonga. So that was where I'd got to after two months. And then I was rescued. Then things came good. Now, I believe it was the Williamson family, uh, or in particular, who rescued you. Can you tell our audience a little bit more about that? Yes. I had discovered after the first seven or eight weeks that there was tennis played on the tennis court in the middle of the village. I knew there was a tennis court there, but I'd never seen any tennis played on it. Because Sundays, when the tennis was played, I was always in the school. Uh, running a school with 18 students in six different grades required a lot of work. As I said, I had no resources, so I had to create them all. So it required an enormous amount of work. I had long days where I started just after seven in the morning, finished at half past five in the afternoon, or I finished with the sunlight as I had no light in the schoolroom at all. And on the weekends, I spent the weekend in the school. I was working all the time. So I wasn't aware that there was tennis, but I was told after about six weeks that there was tennis on Sunday afternoons. So I went and at one of those tennis afternoons, I met a young guy about a year older than me who introduced himself as Paul Williamson. And he told me he had come to the tennis. I'd not seen him there before to meet me because he wanted to recruit me for the Tamworth Rugby Union Club. And he would take me into Tamworth on the following weekend. We would enrol in the Rugby Union Club and he would get me to and from games every Saturday. That started my rescue. When we were coming back from Tamworth that Saturday, he had his father in the car. His father was in his late 70s. And George Williamson said to me that he'd like me to come and spend the Saturday night with them at the homestead on their property. They came from a sheep property about three miles outside of the village. And I uh, enjoyed, I, I certainly <laughs> welcome that invitation. So I went and spent the night in a proper homestead with a proper bedroom, with a proper bed, with a bathroom that I could use in the morning that had running hot water, etc. And it was just delightful. But when we were having breakfast on the side veranda, lovely sunny day in the sun on the veranda, uh, George said to me that the family had something they would like to propose. I had no idea what that was. No idea. But when George said to me, they would like me to come and live with them while I was in Weabonga, I couldn't believe it. I could not believe it. But, of course, I immediately, immediately accepted the invitation. After working out that they really did mean that invitation, there was Paul, the young man my age, uh, two sisters who were nursing sisters, but they were home looking after their dad at the time and the aged parent. So there were four of them and they all said to me, no, Peter, we really want you to come and live here in this homestead. It was wonderful, Jane. That was the rescue that really got me back on my feet. Yes. And you stayed with them for the rest of that time? I did. I stayed with them for the rest of the time, about 20 months altogether with the Williamson family. And is there still any connection with that family? Uh, I have spoken to a couple of the daughters of Paul. I had lost contact with the people at Weabonga a couple of years after I left Weabonga. My life became so busy that I simply hadn't, I literally did not have time to keep up contact with Weabonga. So I'd lost contact until um, last year.
all those years ago, all those years later. And a couple of the daughters of Paul contacted me. And so I got to speak to them. And I also met his son as well. And I went back to the homestead and visited the son at the homestead. It was wonderful. Yeah, that would have been absolutely amazing, I imagine. Yeah. What other thing, oh, you know, you know, you, you've, it's a big adventure, I think, for um, a young man. And what, have you, what lessons have you taken from that adventure that, that have carried you through, do you think? Well... Um, or experiences have carried you through. I think sometimes it's the experiences yeah, uh, I t I've taken quite a lot from that time. I mean, and they were most impressive two years. I was uh, 2021, 20, um, you know, you're still learning about who you are and what your place is in the world and, and what you think you need to be doing with your life and so on. I was learning all of that while I was there. And uh, one of the things that I learned was the basic decency and goodness of people. All of the people at Weabonga were so kind and generous and supportive of me and of each other that they formed in that village and in the properties around that village a lovely society, just the most extraordinarily supportive, kind, concerned, decent society. And they also brought all of that to their children. So all of that community was working so that the children would grow into good, decent, honest, straightforward, wonderful citizens. So I've take, I took that away with me, Jane, that, that people given a chance, people will be good, decent, kind people. So that's stayed with me all my life. Uh, one other thing that stayed with me all my life was my approach to education. I was really confirmed that child-centred education was right for me and was equally right for the children. So for the rest of the time that I worked professionally in education, that was at the centre of my approach and the centre of my thinking about education, instruction, schools, teaching, working with children. So it was a, a really impactive couple of years, a really impactive couple of years. And coming back to those children, um, you know, what are some of the experiences with, with those children that really surprised you? Um, that Were really they... surprised me. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. Really surprised me. Well, I think, I, so. I think I think the fact that that my theory, which I never called it a theory, my guess that if you opened up decisions to children, they would be very sensible about them. They would take it seriously and they would make appropriate decisions. Now, the fact that they did that. Uh, was not really a surprise. It was a terrific confirmation that my guess about what children were capable of was correct and that I could rely upon their goodwill and their good sense to actually take good decisions, to actually build a curriculum and a syllabus that was best for them. It wasn't a surprise. If it had happened to me a year before, it would have been a big surprise because nothing in my teacher's college experience had got me ready for that. Uh, but it wasn't a surprise. It was just a confirmation that this was a good thing to be doing. Yes, and um, when those children were, were learning in a one-teacher school, um, given the resources or, or lack thereof that you spoke about, really, I suppose, you were the external world you um you were the internet i was indeed and mm. i was a very poor version of it let me tell you <laughs> i i had very limited background in many of the subjects that those kids wanted to follow up but fortunately it was fairly basic maths and fairly basic reading and fairly basic written expression so i was on top of that and I could do the best that I possibly could do to support them in all of that. But yes, I was the internet. The families did have radios. 
Um, they very rarely listened to them. And if they did, it was to listen to the local Tamworth station. You will not be surprised in Grafton to hear that even back in the 1950s, Tamworth played country and Western music. That was what the station was about. Um, very little other than that. So the children never really heard much in terms of um, you know, politics or things to keep up to date in the world. Some of the adults in the surrounding sheep stations did. They listened to the ABC and the ABC as now, the ABC is such a wonderful resource for the country people. It was back then, it was the only resource that country people actually had way back then. So yes, we had a very limited amount of information available to us in the school and I was it. And I was all of the things I say, I was the iPad, I was the laptop, I was the internet, I was it. I took that very seriously. It was a huge responsibility. It is a huge responsibility. You, you are, you know, um, that, is, that is their world for, yeah. for that. And I've got a question from, um, from Danielle. Danielle, is it Danielle Fitton? Yes. Um, Danielle is asking, how did you manage to teach all the different ages of children? Uh, there were children between the ages of five and 15 and there were different numbers in the different class groups. I was able to keep up with them and ahead of them by being absolutely organised. As I said a little earlier, I was at the school at 7.30 and I didn't leave until 5.30. I was there most Saturdays and Sundays for the first six months. Uh, once I had some resources in place, I was able to take some time off and I did play football on the Saturdays and occasionally played tennis on the Sunday. So I had a bit of time off. But the only way to keep up then, and I think the same now, is to be absolutely thoroughly prepared and to have everything ready. So that's what I did. And I had all of the resources were handmade. I made them at home in the homestead overnight. And I had shoe boxes full of all kinds of things that, that the students would need. Uh, it was not easy. The blackboard I had divided into three large blocks and um, in the morning before the children arrive, I had everything for the morning for each of the, the grades up on the blackboard so that the children could read from the blackboard, know what they had to do. I could be working with one or two of the pupils and I knew the others, the other 16, would just be getting on with it. They just got on with it. They were such good kids. They just got on with it. They just did whatever it was that we had decided that we would be focusing on that day. They just got on with it. So you had to rely on them. I had to rely on their goodwill and their cooperation and their positive enjoyment of what they were doing. So I tried to make everything really enjoyable so that they would engage and they would happily do so. But it was a lot of work. It was a hell of a lot of work. And... Further to that, I mean, school's not just all about work. It is about play. What, what was playtime like? Playtime was interesting because the, the majority of them were boys. There were 13 boys and five girls. And the boys were very into running games and ball games and kicking games and very physical games. The girls occasionally did take part in that. And if the girls said, hey, hey, we want to we wanna kick the ball, the boys just let them in. They just all engaged together. So there was never any us and them sort of thing there. Um, the girls, however, did choose to do different things. So the girls, the older girls, who were three girls of 11 years of age that first year, who became 12 the next year, they spent a lot of time talking. <laughs> they spent a lot of time talking about... Uh, the things that girls did in the country then about dressmaking, about knitting, about crocheting, about cooking, um, about handicrafts. So were really, really keen on handicrafts. So they did a lot of, of work in the recess and lunchtime together on handicrafts. They did a lot of talking about that. But they would occasionally get up and have a run around and join in with the boys. But the boys did a lot of physical stuff. 
And in that respect, do you think, you know, the, the, the interests are slightly different. Do you feel there's a lot of difference now between, you know, the children you were teaching and children in, I don't know if you've had much contact with smaller schools in, in, um, in regional areas since, but do you feel that there's much of a difference? I would hope so. I would hope so. The, the difference between the genders back then was extraordinary. Girls did girl things, boys did boys things. Girls grew up to do women's jobs and the range of women's jobs were very narrow, very narrow. You could be a teacher or, a, or you could be a, a nurse or you could work in a shop, that was it. Uh, or you could perhaps become a typist. Uh, none of the girls who went to Weabonga ever had ideas about being a typist. They had no idea what an office was and what a typewriter might look like. So their vision of what they might be able to do was terribly narrow, terribly, terribly narrow. The boys also had a very narrow vision as well, Jane, because they just thought you grew up to be somebody who worked on a farm. Uh, you either took over your parents' property or you took over the role that your dad has as a day labourer who hired out his labour to people who owned farms. Their worlds were very narrow, very narrow. You talked before about whether there was much interaction with the outside world, very little, very little. That's not to say that some of the farming families did not have a bigger vision than that. Some did. And um, quite a number of the kids eventually did go on to college or went on to university. Three of them graduated with degrees. A couple went on to master's degrees out of those 18 kids. But their view of the world was so narrow and so confined then, I would hope that no child in 2020 views the world that way. So you've, you've sort of answered my next question, which is have you stayed in touch with any of the children from those years you were at Weabonga? I have spoken with eight of the children in the last few months, eight of them, and uh, they're all old age pensioners. <laughs> they're all <laughs> retired. <laughs> they, and, they and I are collecting our pensions now. <laughs> uh, look, they all assured me that they had a wonderful life. They all assured me that they had a good start from that little one teacher school. They all assured me that they enjoyed the two years that they were there with me. In fact, the oldest of them, who was 75, he told me the other day, said to me when I was speaking to him the other day, I said to him the other day, look, Kevin, I know you're 75 and I know that you're retired, and <laughs> but you're still the 14-year-old kid that I knew back in 1960. And he said, you've got a great memory. I said, I have got a good memory. I can picture you exactly as you were in that schoolroom as a 14-year-old kid. I said, I've got a perfect memory of you. He said, could you do something for me? I said, well, yeah, whatever it is, Kevin, I'll try to do it. He said, could you take me back there now, physically, take me back there? I said, why would you want to do that? You've had a wonderful life. Kevin had gone on to become a very large landowner with his own large property, exactly what he wanted to achieve in life. He had achieved, he'd married, he had a family and so on. I said, why would you want to go back to that little one room school? He said, because it was the happiest two years of my life. How about that? That's pretty special. I, I could not believe it when he said that. That was just so extraordinary. The happiest two years of his life. Yeah. That's a really, I, I think we should probably <laughs> finish that conversation there. That's too beautiful. Yeah. That's really very lovely. Is there anything um, that, you know, you feel, I, I mean, obviously there's so much more in the book, but that's really what I would like our readers to, 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 get, out of, to get out of that, to delve into that experience a little bit more. But is there one, anything? One, one, of the, like, one of the other threads in the book was my dreadful attempt to run a romance at the time at the time that I was isolated up here in the country, far away from 
everybody that I knew, I was still trying to run a romance. And I uh, had formed a relationship, a friendly relationship with a young woman um, before I'd come up to Weabonga. Just before I came to Weabonga, she had gone to work in Melbourne and she'd gone to work at Channel 7 in Melbourne. And she had a fairly senior position at Channel 7 in Melbourne. So there she was down in Melbourne with all the latest technology that the world had to offer, <laughs> surrounded by artistic, creative, intelligent people. Here was I in Weabonga with nothing, <laughs> literally. Um, so every Saturday morning I rang her on the public phone, on the veranda of the house that was the post office. And that was um, our contact. Uh, every Saturday morning I rang, we, we chatted. I, of course, wrote lots of letters, but we kept that relationship going. And eventually we decided to marry. And so <laughs> at the end of my two years in Weabonga, um, I went down to Melbourne and brought Patricia back to Sydney and we were married in the next year. And all these years later, 59 years, 58 years later, here we are. So that's an important theme that runs through the book as well. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> and, um, and thank goodness you did, because it was your son that managed to um, get us all connected um, to you this evening. So, you know, the, You've got to put in those hard yards, I think, don't you? To, to you do see. indeed, yes. <laughs> you do indeed. <laughs> Are there any other questions? I'd like to hear from other people if they want to ask questions. Are there any questions there? If, if you, yes, Gordon. I suppose, um, Peter and Jane, thanks very much for the opportunity to join. I've, I've got the book. Um, it has Thank you very much, Gordon. Actually, I have three copies, but that's a long story. Um, my wife and son bought me one each. Um, Peter, I went to Westmead Teachers College in 7071, and in 1972, I was sent straight to a one teacher school on the Western Plains, far west of New South Wales, 40 miles west of Hay. And uh, that's where I started my teaching career in uh, 1972. The only reason the school reopened was, was because the parents would board the schoolie or the chalky. I was rotated every term uh, amongst the family. And like you, there was the school. I was probably more fortunate because there was a, a hotel there, which was the, the hub of the town. There were about four or five houses, the post office, the party line, um, the Weirkeeper's Cottage on the Murrumbidgee River. And, uh, and that was it. I didn't have a car either. And yes, uh, it had a, an oval there. It had some tennis courts. And uh, as the schoolie or the chalky, you became the hub of the community there as a secretary of the Jim Carner Club and everything else that, that went on. And uh, like you, it was a wonderful experience. I did have a spirit duplicator though. So I was able to uh, radio off uh, a number of lessons for my kids from kindergarten to whatever age. And uh, your book has brought back some very vivid memories of uh, my start to my teaching career as well. Good memories, I hope, Gordon. Oh, certainly. And my, my inspector was 140 miles away in Narendra. <laughs> and as I said earlier, the inspector came twice and stayed less than three hours on both occasions. So in the two years that I was in Weabonga, I had no discussion about education whatsoever or teaching or instruction. I was very much on my own. Did you find the same thing where you were? Yes, very, very much so. And, and one of the things I, I've noticed over many, many years is with the, and Jane will probably appreciate this, I've worked in community services in local government as well, but the closure of those one teacher schools was at the detriment to that local community. It was all well and good to bus the children into the nearest regional centre, but unfortunately that sense of community identity and involvement, because those people from that local community were never able to then go to the PNC meetings, were never able to interact with the other parents. And I think that's been one of the downfalls of uh, regional and country New South Wales or, or society. I think you're absolutely right, Gordon. I did mention Guy Fawkes was the first place that I was sent to, and there were only six students there. When I found there were six students there, I told the parents that I would have to uh, contact my inspector in Armadale and take his direction. I knew what he would say. I knew that he would say he couldn't open the school. 
And so after I'd made the phone call and came back to the parents, they knew what I was going to say as well. Well, I was surrounded by a group of parents who, when I delivered the message that their school was to close, started to cry. Yeah. They started to yeah. cry for exactly the reason that you've just communicated. They said, that's the end of Guy Fawkes. That exactly. is the end of our community. No school, no community. And so you're quite right. Those little schools did much more than educate children. They held communities together. They gave them a purpose. They gave them a centre. And, okay. they ga and they gave them a resource. I mean, you were saying that you acted as the secretary of the Jim Carner Club and so on. They brought into those little villages people that had skills like you, people that could organise. I mean, the thing about teaching, Gordon, that you recognise more than I do, is you've got to be organised. <laughs> you've got to plan. You have to know where you're going to take all of those students in the next day, in the next week, in the next term, in the next year. And then you have to take them there. So you've got to be so organised and such a good manager that teachers in little villages like that are a wonderful resource for the village which you became when you were there in your Hay Hill and Burligal. Exactly. exactly right. well, well, Peter, from there and, and, and the other listeners there, uh, I actually met my wife when I was out there through a variety of uh, interactions. And then I had the big transfer. I moved from Maud into Hay. I moved 30 miles east. And I oh, spent uh, another uh, few, a number of years then teaching OAs and, and so on in, the, uh, in Hay there. And it was a totally unique experience. But I'm not wanting to hog the, 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 um, the session, Jane, but certainly I'm still working part-time. I work with uh, Blacktown Council in Sydney on the uh, part-time. I look after their sister cities and international relations programs. Right. And one of our sister cities just happens to be, Peter, with Liverpool Plains Shire in uh, New South, northern New South Wales, a place called Corindai. Oh, right. Where, where I enjoyed a couple union. of... <laughs> I enjoyed playing rugby union in Corinda. And I think I say in the book that the people in Corinda were the, were the friendliest yes. people of all of the towns that we went to. The Corinda people were terrific, lovely people. So I'm sure you enjoy your interaction with them. We certainly do. And, and, and look, one of the things that uh, we're very, I'm very adamant on and been able to bring to the table and looking at the one teacher or the small schools that surround Corinda is being able to take up from Sydney, we take up a variety of uh, uh, hip hop dances and music workshops and uh, New Zealand culture and so on. And we travel and we take that around as part of our program to those schools. So as the children there don't, are not disadvantaged and do get to experience what the children in Sydney do, which is exactly what you've alluded to in your yeah. book as well. I, I think that you're still a teacher. You're still very involved <laughs> in education, Gordon. <laughs> but again, it, it's a sense of community. Um, it's driven by the community. It involves the community. They are yeah. the decision makers. And yeah. we have such a wonderful program. And uh, they have a very high uh, Kiwi population up there who travel south to work in the mines in Singleton. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, so they're disassociated yeah. with their families while they're away working. And we've yeah. brought... Uh, a reminder of their culture to the town and uh, with the Maori wardens and so on. So again, all of that has come out of that background of being in an isolated one teacher school and yes. seeing what is required. So Jane, thank you so much for, for Good listening. On Good and, on you. And I'm yeah. glad you've got three books. <laughs> <laughs> um, it brought back some wonderful memories. Kindergarten of the Air at 9.30 on the radio. Uh, the only thing we had, yeah. <laughs> different to you, Peter, we had gaps in the floorboard. So when the uh, dust storms <laughs> came through underneath the, underneath the one, one room building, in had come the dust and uh, it was incredible. So the PNC, we looked to fundraise for an air conditioning unit. <laughs> oh, good idea. Um, I'm just thinking there are a couple of mentions of snakes in the books. Yes. <laughs> You're talking about gaps in the floorboards. Did the snakes come up through the floorboards? We were very lucky because one of the uh, girl's parents was an actual, was an actual a snake catcher. So oh, right. we, did, we didn't, and he'd been bitten many times, so we didn't have a problem. <laughs> Good to talk with you, Gordon. Wonderful. Um, we better so go back to Jackie. Is there? 
we're no we're f we're fine and in fact i think we're, we're getting up to that seven o'clock mark so uh -huh. i'm just <laughs> you're sounding a bit raspy there i'm feeling a little bit that, that way myself but um and i, I think um uh, Danielle's the only other one I can see there on the screen. Any other questions, Danielle? Or all, all answered? Happy listening? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, Peter, thank you so very much. Um, Gordon, obviously, I don't need to tell you to read the book. You've got three coffees. Um, but for, for any others who haven't yet re read the book... Um, I can see the book in the background behind you there. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it's beautifully propped in the light box. Yeah, I've yeah. presented, presented it there for you. Um, and would you like to suggest where people can purchase that book from, Peter? I think um, I did make inquiries earlier, and I think that Big W in Grafton actually has yes. copies. Yes, and also we have uh, the Gra uh, Grafton uh, Book Warehouse, and I, I know that they will sell it. And I know we also have... Uh, 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 two copies on in our catalogue. So Good. thank you very much. Yeah, um, if there are other questions that people want to follow up, there is a Facebook page that they can uh, right. access. Uh, Bush School by Peter O'Brien is the Facebook page. Yes, I think we have liked it, but I will make sure to go and um, and and send out a link to to everybody who's Great. attended. Right. That and perhaps stay in touch and continue those conversations with you because it's obviously um, it's really struck a chord. I thought it would. I thought it would really stru strike a chord with our, our community, and um, uh, I think it will strike a chord with, with many a community, um, bush or uh, city. I don't. I think um, it's a story that is is really important to be told. So thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me there. And I've really enjoyed being with you at the Clarence Library. It's been terrific. Thank you. And thank you, everybody, for attending. Thank you. Big round of applause. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>